Genovese soldier George Barone lived a hell of a life, even by mob standards. When once asked how many people he'd killed, he responded, I didn't keep a scorecard. Throughout his many years alive, he'd been a World War II hero, inspired the film West Side Story, been a close associate of Vito Genovese, became Fat Tony Salerno's hitman, and made a fortune in waterfront racketeering. But in the end, a deadly fallout with Vincent Giganti led to George Barone breaking his Cosa Nostra oath. Let's check him out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. I'd just like to quickly say a massive thank you to Tom Lavecchia and John Pinisi, who said some very kind words about my channel the other day on their excellent podcast, The NBA and the Button Man. I urge you all to check it out. Today, we're going to take a quick look at the life and times of the powerful waterfront racketeer and hitman for Fat Tony Salerno, George Barone. He was born in 1923 in Bentonhurst, Brooklyn, but not long after, his family moved over to Chelsea. Barone's father was Italian, and George would say about his own heritage, I am a mongrel. I'm partly Italian, Irish, and Hungarian. He grew up brawling on the West Side streets, and after dropping out of school to work, he enlisted in the Navy shortly after the outbreak of World War II. Barone was shipped out to fight the Japanese over in the Pacific, and his naval records show that he participated in five invasions, including Guam, Saipan, and Iwo Jima. Interestingly, two of Barone's Genovese family contemporaries, Matty the Horse Ainiello and Benny Eggs Mangano, also did their patriotic duty and actively served in this war before their criminal careers took off. After the war, Barone did a brief stint in the Merchant Marines before an injury cut this career short, and he found himself back on the west side hooking up with his boyhood pals who had started working with the unions on the docks. Joining the ILA in 1949, he landed a job as a hiring boss on the Lower West Side Pier 58, allegedly thanks to some old acquaintances who'd become prominent gangsters on the Upper West Side. In 1954, William Torres, a union member, complained that Barone was constantly refusing to hire him. Barone later tracked down Torres and chased him into a meat market on West 14th Street where he proceeded to savagely beat him with an 18-inch long metal bar. Barone was arrested and charged with assault, but his lawyer managed to get Barone off with a $50 fine after a disorderly conduct plea. George Barone subsequently lost his union job, and when later recalling what his next career move was, he bluntly said, I became a gangster. With career criminal Johnny Earl, Barone formed a gang called The Jets a name that was allegedly the inspiration for one of the street gangs in the film West Side Story. However, Barone and Earl's group was nothing like the high school gang with switchblades portrayed in the movie. They were a vicious gang of criminals, which allegedly included another future Genovese member, Lawrence Little Larry Dentico. When later talking about his violent ways, Barone would say, I got a track record of being in a lousy, dirty, rotten environment where killing was part of staying alive. Dog eat dog, he was asked. Dog kill dog, he responded. As well as fighting off the other Irish and Italian gangs for control of the local numbers and loan sharking, Johnny Earl and Barone made a massive score of several hundred thousand by murdering and robbing bank robber Redmond Ninny Cribbins. The pair hid in Cribbins' hideout, and when he returned, Barone pushed him down and fired several shots into him. Ninny Cribbins had something we wanted. He resisted, and we shot him. The Jets' success and reputation was getting noticed by the big boys, and mob heavyweight Vito Genovese took the gang under his wing. Barone and Earl dealt directly with Genovese himself at his Thompson Street headquarters in Greenwich Village. The Jets conducted various work for Don Vitone, including arranging a favourable deal with an ILA local for a cargo packing company that Genovese owned. Earl and Barone grew close with the mob powerhouse, who in particular took a liking to Johnny Earl. Earl was also friendly with another Genovese protege, Vincent Gin Giganti. However, things turned sour with Don Vitone when in 1958, Johnny Earl was gunned down. 
allegedly due to an internal dispute with other members of the Jets over the split of criminal proceeds. Earl's killer was allegedly K.O. Konisberg, who claimed that Barone had provided him with the murder weapon. Years later, Barone would angrily say, I never met K.O. Konisberg. Johnny Earl was my best friend. Without him, I was nothing. The guy took me out of the gutter. Interestingly, one theory is that fellow Jets gang member Lawrence Dentico was the one who provided the gun and drove the getaway car for the Earl murder. The killing of Johnny Earl upset Vito Genovese as he'd grown fond of the young mobster. Don Vitone then severed ties with the Jets. Barone recalled, He just disowned us all, and the Jets, including me. I was left wandering at sea, you might say. But as one door closes, another opens, and Barone found another mentor in Genovese heavyweight Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. Salerno was based out of his East Harlem headquarters, the Palmer Boys Social Club, and he recognised that Barone was good mob muscle and he could utilise his knowledge of the unions and the New York docks. Barone, in turn, said that the formidable Fat Tony was very likeable, very fair and powerful. He quickly established himself as one of Fat Tony's favourite guys when it came to carrying out a piece of work. Salerno sent Barone out to Kentucky in the 1960s to kill a black gambler who was causing problems for his operations out there. Barone didn't know his name, it didn't matter, it was his job and he didn't discriminate. As he would say, black, green, yellow, whatever. Barone killed John Biello, a Miami based mobster who had angered Salerno, and also a gangster known as Tommy the Greek who had spoken badly of Anthony Scotto. And he killed Johnny Futo, a Miami dance hall owner. Why? Because Tony wanted him killed, and I killed him. Barone believed that he killed between 12 and 20 guys, but that he didn't keep score. Most of these murders were simply, unquestionably, following orders. He said he killed people because Fat Tony told me to. I did whatever he asked me to. He is my boss. All of the killings were just part of the life. But after being taken in by Tony Salerno and witnessing how Fat Tony conducted business and had made something of himself, George Barone wanted that too. His ticket for success was his union knowledge. Fat Tony would rely on Barone for his understanding of waterfront business. As he would later say about Salerno's knowledge of affairs down the docks, he didn't know anything. He had no idea what we were talking about most of the time. He used to call a container a boxcar. With Fat Tony Salerno behind him, George Barone became a massive success on the docks and with the unions. He climbed the ranks of the ILA, eventually making it to the position of International Vice President. The New York Times described Barone as handsome, articulate and ambitious. Barone made his mob benefactors very wealthy with his union racketeering. In the early 1970s and after being sponsored by Fat Tony Salerno, George Barone was officially inducted into the Genovese crime family. The ceremony was conducted in an apartment on 115th Street. Shortly after being made, he was able to wield his new power when a young union official called Harold Daggett boasted that he was going to take over one of Barone's union locals. Barone had one of his men bring Daggett to the back room of an East Harlem fruit and vegetable store. Barone would later testify what followed. What happened then was, we scared the shit out of him. I threw a shot at him and told him, excuse me, we freaking would kill him if this is not straightened out. Daggett pissed in his pants and did everything else and cried like a baby and laid on the floor. It was a very bad day for Mr. Daggett. George Brown's work with the waterfront unions led him to Florida where he would continue to make money for the mob throughout the 70s. However, in 1979, he was convicted of racketeering and sentenced to 15 years in prison. After a lengthy appeal, this was finally reduced to 12 and a half years, and Barone started his sentence in 1983. When the 67-year-old Barone was released in 1990, he found that many things had changed. His mob mentor, Fat Tony Salerno, was in prison and would die two years later, and despite still holding influence on the waterfront, Younger mobsters had filled important positions and Barone was feeling disrespected. 
This was especially evident a few years later with his dealings with Andrew Giganti, the son of Genovese family boss Vincent Giganti, who himself was now in prison. But Rome was ordered to help Andrew Giganti win a contract for a container repair company. However, this company owed Barone $90,000 from a previous deal, and Barone refused to help them or Andrew Giganti until he was paid what he was owed. The owner of the company, Umberto Guido, flew down to Florida and offered Barone $3,000. George Barone told Guido to tell Andrew Giganti to stick it up his ass. Barone thought little of Vincent Giganti's son Andrew, saying that he was a drunk and a junkie. He'd go into the bathroom and come out flying like a kite. Things between Andrew Giganti and George Barone would escalate, and word came down from the top that Barone was to be put on the shelf, essentially sending him into exile from the family. However, eventually Barone was paid $45,000 of what he was owed. Barone then received a call from an old union friend, Jimmy Cashin, who told him that the remaining $45,000 was in New York for him to collect. But Cashin then added, George, don't come, they're going to kill you. Everyone knows it. He also received the same warning from another old friend, Glenn McCarthy. While pondering his next move, George Barone was arrested by the FBI on an extortion charge and was facing another lengthy spell inside. Angry at the betrayal from the Genovese family that he had served so loyally for many years, George Barone made the decision to become a government witness. As he put it, I wanted to get even. I wanted to survive. I didn't want to get killed by them. George Barone died a free man on December the 28th, 2010, at the age of 86. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.